Hello, Tri-State Sherm, and welcome to Leading in the Experience Age, an executive's guide to the new workforce paradigm. My name is Ed Crow. I'm a talent transformation expert, and I want to talk to you today about where we need to take our businesses as we now enter into the experience age. We're going to talk about what the experience age is, why it's so important to bring our businesses into the experience age, and then more importantly, what it's going to do for us when we get there. So let's jump right in. So if you thought we were still in the information age, I want you to think again. You see, the information age started with the dawn of the internet. And suddenly we had this plethora of information right at our fingertips. And yes, that information still exists. But I want you to think about how we use that information today. You see, we can go out to the web and in a moment's notice, we can scroll fine through tens of thousands of data points on whatever search term we put in. But you see, things are so much more than that today. Think about how we use social media, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, you name it, right? There's dozens and dozens of platforms out there. And essentially what you'll find is you'll find people sharing their lives through social media, their experiences. And we're starting to see society shift from using the information that's at our fingertips for simply gaining knowledge to transferring that information into experiences. That's what has brought us into the experience age. Now, as HR professionals, you might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with us? And you know, social media can be a nightmare for sure. Well, what we're seeing is that in today's workplace, employees want and crave experiences. They want a workplace where they can bring their fullest selves to work every day. They don't wanna check emotions, feelings, parts of themselves at the door. They don't want to have to compartmentalize things. Now, sure, again, if we look at things, we might say, well, gosh, maybe we don't want them bringing all of their selves to work. And certainly there may be certain parts of their personal lives we'd rather not know about. But my point is that we must create an experience for our employees. That is what is going to draw new people to us, the good talent to us. It's what's going to retain and motivate the talent that we have. So it's absolutely critical that we bring our workplace into the experience age. Now, let me tell you a quick story about an organization that didn't do that. I got a call last year from an organization that I had worked with previously. And the director of HR said, Ed, we've got a plant that just isn't performing up to expectations. And this plant was in the same geographic area as several of their other plants. And so they couldn't figure out why this plant was such an anomaly. Why were the other plants doing well, but this one just wasn't getting on board. And so we agreed for me to, to come in and do a quick assessment of what was going on there. And I quickly figured out what some of their challenges were. And so I sat down with the management team and I laid out a plan for what would solve their problem. And without going into a lot of details, in essence, it, it involved getting them out of the industrial age. You see, they had never even made it into the information age. They had an aging workforce in this facility. In fact, this particular plant, the average age was eight years older than the average age of all their other plants. So there was a huge demographic difference there. They were finding that as they tried to bring new talent in, it wasn't staying because of the, the demographic differences there. And so we had to get them out of the industrial age thinking of people punching a clock and coming in and, and punching a clock when they left. And, and that idea that, that work is just something I do and create an experience. 
So we laid the plan out and management smiles on their faces. And they said, Ed, we love this plan. This is, this is going to work for us. I said, great. I, I thought you might think that. And they said, there's only one problem. They said, we don't have money set aside in the budget to fix this plan. Now, you might be thinking, of course, you know, things cost money to fix. But you see, I left out one important piece. They knew that this problem was costing them about $1.5 million a year, that this productivity issue was costing them a million and a half a year. So they knew the hard costs. And of course, the process to fix this was going to be a fraction of that. And they saw that within about 12 to 18 months, they'd start to recoup some of the money that they spent not only on the project, but in chipping away at that million and a half loss that they were just writing off every year. And I said, well, guys, how does this not make fiscal sense? And they said, well, we, we see the numbers on paper, but we just don't have the money in the budget. And as we wrapped the meeting up, I, I left sort of shaking my head and thinking, okay, how often would one of us do this, right? We have a problem. We're presented with a solution that we know would work. And yet we choose not to take that solution knowing that the solution is going to cost some money in the short run, but in the long run is going to save tenfold, twentyfold, whatever it might be. And I came back as I pondered this with, with just one word that kept coming up to me, complacency. This organization, this particular set, I, I guess not in or the organization as a whole, but this particular management team at this facility was so set in their old ways they, it was kind of like the devil that you know is better than the devil you don't know. And so they were content to be mired in this lack of productivity, this churning of new talent, and most egregiously, the writing off of a million and a half a year in lost productivity. We're going to solve problems like that today. I'm going to show you how we get our companies into the experience age and out of that complacency island that we may find ourselves on from time to time. So honestly, what, what is happening is that the change is here, right? Um, we've got this shift from just information to this experiential aspect of the web. Think about online shopping. And what has happened, especially in the last year during the pandemic and how that's just blown up, how it's so much easier for us to get online, see what we want, click a few buttons, and all of a sudden Amazon shows up a day or two later with our products. Um, think about how we use our phones to experience the world and how there are apps for augmented realities. Um, if you've ever played around with some of that stuff when you've been uh, at tourist sites or things. It's amazing what's happening. And so along with that, with this uh, on-demand type of information that we're gathering, this on-demand of I order one day, it shows up the next, our expectations of service have really changed. It's gone through the roof, right? I mean, we want stuff, we want it now. Our employees and what we're seeing in the employment marketplace is that they're expecting the same thing. They're expecting that on-demand service type of experience as an employee. And so we're going to see a lot of parallels between how we use the web and the information from it to experience life and for our experiences as customers with organizations and see that that's bleeding into what our employees expect out of their employment experience. There's going to be some amazing parallels there. And of course, there's the old saying that you can't expect customers to love your business until your employees love your business. And that's where the magic of bringing our workforce and our companies into the experience age really lies in getting our people to love our business. Because here's what's going on right now with today's workforce. 
And I, and I want to make something very clear. This is not a generational thing. Yes, Gen Z and the millennials are pushing this hard. Absolutely, those two young generations are pushing for this. However, we're seeing my generation is, as a Gen Xer, we're craving this too. And even some of the boomers are starting to realize that they want more out of the employment experience. And so what employees want is this, this idea that I can experience work in a new way. That they wanna get the most out of their personal lives but the younger generations are blending this idea that, that we don't separate work and person. I'm all the same person that comes to work. I'm the same person that goes and plays softball, that hangs out with my friends or plays in a band or whatever. They're the same person. And so they want that information to come together that they can use it to, again, bring their full self to work every day. We're finding, and we're going to look at some case studies, some of the best brands out there are inviting their people to come as their full selves every day with all the baggage that entails. And that's a leap of faith because we've got to remember that that baggage is there if someone brings their full selves. But I'm willing to bet that at the end of our time together today, you're going to see that the benefits far outweigh the baggage. So really, what is the experience age that we're in today? You know, honestly, I believe it all comes down to an emotional connection with one another. If you're on social media, and I'm willing to bet just about everyone in the session today is on some platform of social media, whether you're using it strictly for business, like perhaps LinkedIn, or maybe you're getting news feeds from Twitter, or whether you're on Facebook or one of the other uh, many platforms. You're probably using it, <coughs> excuse me, to stay connected with friends, family, relatives, what have you, what's going on in their lives. Maybe it's where you get your news feed. Um, maybe you're in a faith-based group in social media. Maybe that's how you participate in our political system, whatever it is. Think about how you use social media how you use it to experience life. I mean, I think about um, the, the quote old days when maybe a friend went on some exotic vacation and what did they do? Um, they invited you over to their house, they had a cookout and maybe they had a slide projector or something and they put the slides up and you saw their pictures of the Grand Canyon, right? Um, what happens today? We're seeing pictures of them at the Grand Canyon as they're there. They're taking pictures, posting it onto to social media, and we can see it. We're experiencing what they're experiencing. We're seeing them post not just pictures, but live video feeds so that we can really immerse ourselves in that experience. Well, again, if you look at the fact that people just don't turn themselves off when they come to work, they don't turn their personal selves off when they come to work, it would make complete sense to understand why Folks want that same experience to continue through in the workplace. And workplaces that harness that are the ones that are going to thrive in the experience age. So what we have to think about is what are the ongoing positive experiences that we are asking our people to have at work? Or what are they having at work? And are they welcome to share that information? You know, I recall not that long ago, sitting at HR conferences, and the big topic was, should we block Facebook? Should our um, systems block Facebook? Because people are going to be wasting way too much time on Facebook. And many companies went that route. And I'm not saying that that was a bad decision to make. However, times have changed. And if we block Facebook, are we missing out, or any other platform for that matter, are we missing out on giving our employees the opportunity to share their positive work experiences with the world? You see, the best recruiting tool that we can use are stories and experiences. 
not the posting of, hey, I'm looking for a welder and this is what a welder does. Well, anyone who's in welding knows what a welder does. We don't need to say that in the ad. But if we, what if we gave those prospective welders the opportunity to see what life was actually like as a welder at your organization? And I'm not talking about it in terms of, oh, well, Ed, we, we do that because we give folks a tour. No, I'm talking about it pure recruitment stage. What are we doing to share what life is like at our company as an employee? What are the things we're doing for our people? So this is a whole new way of thinking, right? Um, th this requires a shift into believing that driving employee experience in the workplace is a business priority. Now, this is about the point where someone says, oh my gosh, Ed, you're talking about employee engagement. No, employee experience and employee engagement are two very different things. You see, if I'm engaged, I'm productive and I'm committed to the company culture and I can be engaged in a workplace that's not giving me the full employment experience, the full life experience, if you will. And so an engaged employee is productive for us. Absolutely. We know that. They may not be our best recruiter, though. And if we have to reach beyond our existing workforce in order to tell our story to prospective candidates, then no matter how engaged our people are, we're missing that leap of experience. And so what we've really got to do is say to ourselves, it's time right now for me to rethink my business processes. Do my business processes support the experience that my people want and crave at this organization. I dealt with an organization that had actually relatively low turnover, but their biggest challenge was that uh, people there, this was a um, professional service practice. So there was quite a lot of direct contact with the customer. And while the people were committed to the organization and to the customer, many of them told me they wouldn't refer their best friends to work there because it was a bad work experience. They had good pay. The environment, the physical environment was good. But in many cases, the owners who were very active in the business, um, this was a group of about 30 owners, so it was a very large organization, um, were treating people poorly. And they were making up for it by paying quite well. But the problem was that if the current employees weren't going to go out and be brand ambassadors, <clears throat> what's happening to the recruiting piece? And so they were creating a situation where they were overpaying their people to make up for the fact that they weren't offering a good employment experience. That's really not the recipe for sound business growth and success. And so we wanna get our people onto this island of the experience age. We wanna get our businesses off of that complacency island in the story that I told you about earlier. I wanna tell you another story. I was speaking on employment brand at a conference, um, one of the last live events actually that, that I did before the, the pandemic hit. And we were talking about the concept of an employment brand and why it's so important to build that up, just like we would build up our marketing brand. And after the session, a CEO comes up to me, his name was Mike, and he hands me his card and he says, Ed, we, we have to talk. And I said, sure, what, you know, what, what can I do for you? And he said, well, I, you know, I run this medical practice and um, I think HR is actively inhibiting my ability to grow this medical practice. And so we scheduled time the following week to chat. And what I found out was that recruiting was a mess. Training was a mess. Um, they were looking to open up a new medical campus across town. He was worried they weren't going to be able to staff it because in the current facility, they had 45 openings. It was taking like 50 days on average to fill an opening. And he's thinking, wait a minute, I got 70 more jobs that are going to get created across town when I open this new facility up how is HR possibly going to, to meet this? And that was his main prerogative from the docs who were the owners of this practice 
get this new facility open. And so he feels like his job is online if he doesn't make this happen. And so we agreed to work together. And, and, and over the course of nine months, we revamped the way HR delivered its promise on an employment brand. The funny thing was, as I interviewed each of the HR people about their jobs and their roles, I asked each one of them similar questions, but I always ended with the same one question. And that was, what is HR's role here at this organization? Now, there were seven people in HR, and I'll give them credit because they were all on point. Every one of them said, my job is to make the employees happy. Now, this is where Ed smacks his head and says, no, no, that is not HR's job. HR's job is not to make employees happy. And let me tell you why I believe that. Our employees don't report to us as HR professionals. It is their supervisors and managers job to deliver on the employment experience. It's our job in HR to push the right processes and the right environment that allows that workplace, that positive workplace experience to really take root. The irony is they were um, failing miserably at making the employees happy. So even though they were all on point and on message, I should say, um, they weren't delivering on that either. And so when I, when I ask you to think about what business processes do you have that are getting in the way of delivering the right kind of employment experience for your people? Do you block social media, for instance? Maybe some of you work in a very um, secure setting. Maybe it's a government facility. And you know, I certainly, there are clients I have where you know, I've got to check my cell phone at the door kind of thing. I understand that. I know some organizations will not allow, organiza or will not allow employees to participate in March Madness pools, Super Bowl pools, those kinds of things, or uh, to watch the Olympics when the Olympics come on because they think it's a distraction. And every year you see articles written about the quote, cost of March Madness in downward employee production. But I'd ask you this, is it really costing you hard dollars or is it adding to your employment experience that folks can have that little bit of a break to go watch an Olympic event or to go watch a little bit of a March Madness game or what, or what have you. Is that really costing you hard dollars? Maybe it is and that's okay. As long as you know that that hard dollar cost is more or excuse me, is less than what you would gain in positive employee experiences. Because if it's less, then it's time to suck that cost up and go for the employee experience where you're going to get a bigger bang on the money that you're spending. Just something to think about. If I accomplish one thing in our time today, it's to get you thinking differently, or at least opening your mind up to the possibilities of what could be if you change your employment experience. Mike Wadera, the founder of Teleport, he talks a lot about the experience age, and I'd encourage you to, to search him out and, and look at some of his writings. But I love this quote because it, it really does encapsulate what our employees are thinking. You know, how are we consuming the information that, that's hitting us? What is it that our prospective employees want to hear? How are we communicating with prospective employees? How are we communicating with our employees? How are our employees communicating with one another? I mean, this whole shift, this whole shift to the web-based recruiting has dramatically changed how we recruit. If you think about it, we've gone from posting an ad in a newspaper and someone having to physically mail us a resume. So they had to take the time to look through a newspaper ad type up their resume, put it in the mail. There was a level of commitment there just to apply. Think about it now. We put an ad online, I can scan through, and with one button click, I can apply to your job. Send my resume, boom, send my resume, boom. There's no real 
commitment on the part of an applicant. That doesn't happen until much later in the process, usually through the interview stage. When I decide as an applicant whether or not I'm going to be committed to following through on this process. And then we sit and we wonder why, gosh, why do so many people not show up for interviews? Why do so many people not call me back when I offer them a job? Because there's no commitment. We haven't done a good job of telling the story of what life is like at our organization. That is the crux of the experience age. So honestly, what we're, we're really looking at as, as we're evolving as humans is we're not just interested anymore in gathering information. We want to experience life and work is part of life, right? Forget work-life balance, work-life fit, work-life integration. I don't care what you call it. It's just part of who we are. And if the pandemic has proven one thing, it's really blurred those lines. I mean, I'm willing to bet that the majority of you spend at least part of your time remote and maybe a significant part of your time remote and maybe even a significant number of your people are remote as well. So we've blown out of the water the myth that remote employees can't be productive because the studies are starting to roll in showing, you know what, people have been pretty darn productive working from home. Now, some don't like working from home. They want to be back in the office working with their friends and coworkers, and that's great, okay? But this is a, a, a huge concept for us to think about in terms of how do people want to experience their work as we come out of the pandemic? I guarantee you, you're going to have people who want to continue working from home. Other people are going to demand, I want my desk back. I, you know, I want my coffee machine back, that kind of thing. But it all comes back to their need for a workplace experience that fits their desires. This is the magic slide right here. We're going to spend some time on this slide um, because this is really where the meat is. This is how we transform our workforce. So if you've been a little bit tuned out, maybe you've been multitasking here, now's the time to come on back because we're going to talk for a good bit of time here on this slide. So I want you to look at, we're going to go, this is linear, obviously. We're going to start over here at, at number one. What are the business outcomes you're looking to attain that you are not attaining currently? Maybe you're not hitting your uh, piece rates if you're in that sort of an environment. Maybe production is not meeting uh, pr production goals. Maybe shipping is behind. Is customer service uh, results dipping? Um, maybe you are looking to break into a new geographic market, whatever it happens to be, okay? But pick just a couple of business outcomes that you would like to impact through stepping into the experience age. And once you select those couple of pieces, then we go to step two. How do we design an emotional commitment from our employees? So this starts to get into that engagement piece, right? Can we get our employees bought in to achieving those business outcomes. And so the question that we have to answer for them is, what's in it for them? Why should they make the emotional commitment to us versus just being a pawn who shows up for work every day and punches the clock, does the minimum they need to keep their job and punch the clock and go home? Those folks are gonna get run over by people who are emotionally committed to us. And eventually they're gonna select themselves out of the organization. So if you wanna take the next step in productivity and employee engagement and in impacting your recruiting brand and your employment brand, then we have to figure out this emotional commitment. What is it going to take to tie someone together? I recall my, my last in-house experience, I, I was doing consulting and uh, it was a, a, a small consulting practice. And the owner of the practice had brought the, the executive management team together to do strategic plan. And we spent a couple days in the boardroom doing the strategic planning, came up with what we thought was a great plan for growing the business. And 
ideas for how we were going to make those things happen. And we were all committed. There were six of us on the exec team. We were all committed to making this happen. And the owner looked at us and she says, you know, I, I like these goals, um, but yeah, we're not gonna do those other things. And I remember we kind of looked around at each other and we didn't say much, but we went out to dinner that night because we were a dispersed work group. So we were, we were all in town for this. And several of us were out to dinner and saying, why did we just you know, leave our families for a couple of days, make this travel, spend all this mind power and energy coming up with a plan only to be told, yeah, we're not going to do that. Talk about destroying an emotional commitment. We were all ready. We were all in on working towards hitting those goals. And the owner with one sentence put the kibosh on all of it and demoralized all of us. Guess what happened? The next six months, over half of us on the executive team left. There was no more emotional commitment. It was clear that, that the effort that, that we had and the plan that we had to make those things come to fruition didn't matter. It's the kiss of death. And so I'd ask you to think about, do you have managers that are giving that kiss of death to creative and otherwise productive employees? Are they sucking that lifeblood out of your organization? Now, once we get that emotional commitment, here comes experience age. Look at number three, design the compelling experience. What do we want life to be like at our organization? And please, 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 this does not mean throwing pizza party Fridays and donut Tuesdays and, and all the other, I'll call them fluffy things, okay? I'm not saying that you shouldn't do those things. I'm just saying that's not a workplace experience, okay? It's a nice little fluffy thing. And if you're in HR and you're still planning those things, get those things off your plate, give them to an employee committee. You have much more important work to be doing. Another topic for another day, but there's my soapbox. You have much more important work to be doing. I want you to think high level. Notice the word compelling experience. What makes me want to come in and give you my all every single day? Yes, my manager is going to play a part in that. But what is it about the mission of the organization? What is it about the environment, both physical and just the emotional environment in which I'm stepping into every day? And if I'm a remote employee, the experience age can mean a couple different things. I was just on a call today uh, with an HR manager and the owner of an organization and the HR manager was at home because guess what? Her students, or excuse me, her, uh, her son's classroom got shut down because of too many COVID cases. So she had screaming kids in the background of the call. It's life today, right? It's part of the experience today of allowing our people to manage their time effectively. So what does a compelling experience mean for your people? That's the first thing you have to ask yourself. And the best way to find out, ask them. Ask them what they want out of the workplace. Now, if you're in a larger organization, step four is critical for you. I want you to just start with your highest impact roles, okay? Don't try and plan something that you're gonna roll out. If you've got a several hundred, several thousand person organization across several facilities, across several states, something like that, you've gotta start small. Test, retest, see what's working. And remember, that what works in one facility, one office may not work in the next one. One size is not gonna fit all when we're talking about creating the employment experience. And so where a lot of this then starts is here at step five, which is changing behavior. Not necessarily the behavior of our people, but of leadership, of the messages that they're sending, of the environment they're creating, and of the expectations they're setting. Do all of those things roll back up into that compelling experience and pull at the heartstrings of our people to continue to foster that emotional commitment? I'll tell you one of my best clients that, that gets this right, they are a not-for-profit um, focused on 
creating workplace opportunities and providing resources for folks with disabilities. When you step into that workplace, it, I mean, I noticed it 20 years ago when I started working with them. Service dogs, they train them. They're wandering around the office. Um, some of them are on duty being trained, others are not. And that was well before bring your dog to work days. It was part of their culture because that was part of what they did. And it was just the coolest thing to be greeted by one of these service dogs when you walked in the door. One of them had been trained to greet visitors. Um, it was a cool environment and is still a very cool environment. And I feel that vibe every time I walk in to that office. Talk about an experience. As a vendor, I'm feeling it. And you know what the result is? Very low turnover for them. Very low turnover because they've created, they've changed the behaviors to stay focused on the business while creating this really cool environment, this really cool experience for their employees. Now take a look at number six, citizen-led innovation. Here we're talking about pulling your people into the problem solving process. Our people have the answers. You know this, I know this. Let's make sure our management team knows that our people have the solutions. Let's make sure we're going to our people and asking them for help in solving our biggest, most challenging business problems. Don't fall in to what I experienced where our boss asked us to come up with a strategic plan. We did, she loved it, but said she wasn't gonna commit the resources to making it happen. That makes zero sense. So I'm a big believer in recognizing that our people hold the keys to our success. It's not just the people that sit in the boardroom or the executive management team. It's our people that are out there making the widgets and dealing with our customers every single day. How can we innovate with them? How can we bring them into this new employment experience where they're truly a part of the team and not just a cog in the wheel. Because ultimately that's what a lot of the employment experience comes down to. It's feeling like I'm a part of something bigger and I'm committed to that. Now, step seven, I could also call this stay out of the jelly of the month club, okay? You've got to commit to a long-term journey. We're talking about culture change. And depending on where your company is currently with its culture, the nature of the work that you do, your industry, all of those things certainly can influence your culture. And will also determine how long it's gonna take you to turn this big ship around. So when you think about the journey, remember that establishing a new culture is a journey. And that's why I like to start small with those high impact roles and then roll that out to one facility or to one shift. And as you experience successes, learn from them, roll them out to other places. As you have some setbacks, learn from them, correct them, and then roll them out to other facilities, other shifts, other roles. But be very deliberate in how you're doing what you're doing. If I go back to my medical practice, we wanted to target our frontline nurses because we knew when we think about those high impact roles, those are the folks that are gonna make or break our practice. Yeah, you've got the docs who are providing the surgical expertise and things, absolutely. But who are the people meeting and spending the most time with? The nurses and the physical therapists, at least in this particular practice. And so we started with those folks and we wanted to get them on board with this new workplace experience. And we revamped our processes to ensure that we were fostering a level of engagement with them, making sure that they had the tools they needed to succeed in terms of not just physical tools, but training. And then opening up the lines of communication. We turned all the employee event planning over to them. Anything that had to do with decorating the office space, celebrating holidays, you name it, all went to this employee committee. 
One, because I believe that's where it belongs. It does not belong in HR. We are too valuable to be party planners. But two, that helps foster that commitment to the organization. And the employees know what the other employees want. So let's let them do the problem solving and make it happen. But it is a journey. We must recognize that. Now, the next thing you have to think about, step eight, is who are your cultural influencers? Who are the people in your organization? Who are those informal leaders? You might consider them one of your high impact roles that we talked about there in step four. And I would say, get those people on board quickly. And you'll find those cultural influencers at all levels of your organization. You probably know who they are. Maybe you've never thought about it in those terms before. But you'll want to make sure that those people are fully engaged with you. And they're on board. They understand why we're doing this because they're going to rally the troops. Now, what do we do with the unwilling? That's step nine. Okay, you're going to have some folks that aren't going to want to go on this journey with you. You're going to have folks that are going to say, ah, we've done stuff like this before. I'm going to hang out because this ain't going to last. You're going to have folks that say, ah, I've only got, what, three years till I retire. Ah, <laughs> I'm not going to mess with that. You've got to manage those folks out of your organization. They will suck the lifeblood out of you and the organization. And those of you that are in smaller organizations, wow, the damage can be huge. I was called into a small advertising firm, about a dozen or so employees. And the owner was looking, uh, he was, he's in his early 60s, was looking to hire a successor that he could mentor and eventually sell the business to. And he found a gentleman he really liked, asked me to, to meet with the guy, not a real formal interview, but a meet and greet. And I had some big concerns, shared them with the owner. And he said, yeah, but I really think this is my guy. I'm going to hire him anyway. <laughs> Guess what? Six months later, I was in there because this guy was behaving badly. Uh, and when I say badly, think some of the worst things you can think of. Think about discriminatory remarks, uh, harassing behavior, um, alienating customers. It, it, this guy was the proverbial bull in the china shop. So we gave him that, that last and final warning, clean up or you're out. Well, three months later, he was out. And he left in his path a wake of destruction, of lost productivity, lost employees. And this owner now lost a year of searching and training someone to be his ultimate replacement in the firm. Huge, huge setback for this little but very successful firm. Now, finally, the last thing we have to do, remember we started out number one with looking at a few concrete outcomes. Well, we've gotta be measuring those outcomes, right? And so that's what, what step 10 is all about, tracking where we're headed and are we headed towards the goals? If not, you've got a correct course. Maybe we need to change the goals. I hope not because hopefully you've you really thought those goals out ahead of time but if we may need to tweak our course, right? And that's okay. This is a journey. It's gonna take time. People say, Ed, how long does it take to do this? Three months, four months, what do you think? I just laugh. I, you can't answer that. Until you know what your environment is like and how much it needs to change, it could take from months to years to change your culture. And if you're at the longer end of that spectrum, that can be a very daunting thought like, oh my gosh, I want some results now. You will get some results now, but the gold mine is at the end of the journey. And so that's what we really have to, to keep our minds focused on and our goals focused on is the, the, the big results at the end of the journey. Now, um, you are getting all of these slides as a handout. So this is going to be a great resource for you. This slide has some great do's and don'ts with employee experience. I want to point out just a couple of them here today. I want you to think about how you are rewarding your people, both financially in terms of their base pay, any merit increases you may give out, bonuses you may give out, your, your medical and ancillary benefits, 
what do all of those look like? Do they reflect what your people really want? That's a, that's a key question. And the only way you can know, ask your people. Ask your people if those things are meeting their needs. And if not, see what you can do to impact that. Can you revamp your program? Look at the workplace. How does it feel in your workplace? Is it bright? Is it welcoming? Is it clean? Simple things like that can go a long way to creating a great employee experience. But I want you to, to take some time on your own to really take a look at this data that I've given you here. Um, because this is going to help you to set the goals that we just talked about, especially from an HR perspective, the, the goals that we need to set as HR people to set the right environment to create the right experience. So I mentioned before that engagement and experience are not the same thing. And I just wanted to reiterate that quickly for you. If you take a look, um, Experience is all about putting people at the center and knowing that if we focus on our people and get that emotional connection, man, they're going to do wonderful things for us. Versus that engagement is, is oftentimes that short-term fix. John does something, I give him a gift card and say thank you. You know, that'll create some engagement and goodwill, but that is not employee experience. And so if you look, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to blend the employee's expectations and needs and wants with the organization's needs and wants. And when we get that overlap, when, when those things combine, that's where employee experience takes over. And if we're creating the right employee experience, look out. We are going to see bottom line results. And folks, there is no higher calling in HR than to drive bottom line results for your organizations. That's why we exist. I debate people on this all the time. It's not to throw parties. It's not to be the compliance police. It's not to be the paper pushers. It's to drive bottom line results. And if some of those things help to drive bottom line results, great. And yes, I know we got to do the compliance stuff, but we're called to be drivers of organizational performance. That's what separates the great HR folks from those that are still lamenting that they don't have a seat at the table. It's because the folks that are there are helping to drive business results. So when we think about our brand, I've mentioned this a couple of times and I want to dive into it here uh, as we're in the home stretch. What does your brand value say about you? And I'm not just talking about your marketing brand. What does your employment brand say about you? Because your employment brand will highly impact your marketing brand. Again, I said it earlier, customers won't love your company until your people love your company. And so if we can't, if we don't focus on our people, there's no way they can focus on the customer. So often companies get, get so worked up and tied up in, oh, what's our customer experience like? And you'll hear that term. And in fact, you're even seeing customer experience officers in organizations now. They call them CXOs. Maybe you have one. And that's great. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't have that. But what about your employee experience? Where's your chief employee experience officer, right? Because we can't drive a great customer experience without a great employee experience. We can't have a great marketing brand without a great employment brand. That's where it all starts. So the question is, what is our brand promise? Notice we've got a promise and then we've got the, what the experience really is. So what are we selling to our employees when we're trying to get them in the door? And what are we actually delivering on? What are we telling our customers they'll get if they work with us? What are they actually getting? That overlap, that authenticity, we want that overlap to be as large as possible. That's how we retain customers. That's how we attract new customers. It's how we retain employees. It's how we attract new employees. And we're attracting the customers we want and we're attracting the best and brightest employees. 
So this isn't a session on customer service, okay? But do you see how they blend together, okay? That perception of, of my experience and what you promise me have to blend together. If not, we'll be perceived as inauthentic and we are not gonna attract the best and brightest talent. And the talent that we have is not gonna be motivated to drive business results for us. So I wanna just talk about two quick case studies. Think about Nike and their just do it, right? We all know just do it. That is so alive inside their organization as well. When they have um, uh, problems, challenges, what do you think they tell their people? Just do it. Let's figure out how we make this happen. Climb that mountain, run that race, finish what you started, okay? So how can you differentiate your employment brand from your competitors. And please, your competitors are not just folks that are in your industry. It's anyone with whom you're competing for talent. You know, can you get your employment brand to be the Nike swoosh, right? Everyone recognizes the Nike swoosh. Can you get your employment brand to the point where people know when they see your brand, they say, that's a great place to work. Man, I would love to get to work at that company. It is possible. The other biggie, you probably thought this was coming, Disney, right? They've got a complete holistic approach. For the, I'm sure there's some folks in the session that are huge Disney fans. I mean, you step on Disney property, it's an immersive experience. And their employees will tell you it's immersive for them as well that when you go buy French fries at the stand, that could be a vice president working that day because Disney employees are expected to rotate through the parks and be frontline a certain amount of time every year. You guys probably know this, but all of that drives brand loyalty. Disney doesn't tolerate anyone being out of character who's public facing and that results in a great customer experience. So again, how does that tie back in so many people want to go work at Disney. Can you drive that same level of desire in the group you're looking to pull into your workplace? Now, there's always a downside to things, okay? And I wanna talk about those briefly as we're, we're wrapping up. Take a look at the, this 2017 report. You know, companies that have superior customer service experiences grew five times faster than those with poor customer service experiences. And you say, Ed, what does that have to do with an employment brand? Well, they're inextricably linked, right? Who's providing that great customer experience? Our employees. So the correlation here is that if we don't give our employees a great experience, we can rest assured that our customer experience is going to falter and it's gonna negatively impact our business results. And ultimately, if you look here at the Oracle study, it only takes one time and 68% of people are going elsewhere. Those ratios hold true for the war on talent. One time, is probably all the chance you're gonna to get to blow it with an employee. And if they're good and they've got a lot of talent, they will easily find other employment. And so what we've got to start with are employee expectations. They want personalization. They want some level of immediacy. No longer can we wait for that annual employment review to give them the, the pat on the back. How often are we creating interactions with our employees and the management team, the executives, the owners, HR? Do they really feel like they are a part of the team? Can we use some technology to drive and cultivate relationships? With your dispersed workforce today, one of the things that we're finding is that, of course, people miss the interaction. And they say, gosh, you know, I used to go to just grab a coffee in the break room to get away from my desk. And I don't do that anymore. If you're managing a remote workforce, what if you just did something simple like telling your people, hey, take a virtual coffee break with one of your coworkers that you're not in the office with right now. 
you know, get a lemon spin, literally 10 minutes on Zoom drinking coffee. I've heard a lot of people doing virtual happy hours and things. We could do those sorts of things to create that break for our people, even those that are in a remote type of environment. And I would say it's more critical to make sure that those folks are still having a good employment experience. Because remember, we tend to think that, oh, if someone's working remotely, oh, that's great. They're sitting at home, they're doing whatever. But the problem is their work now never goes away, right? They were so used to going to work and then leaving the workplace and now the workplace is in their home. And for many folks, that's a, that's a huge mindset shift and can be really weighing on them. So if we're going to use technology, how can we use it to create or recreate real human interactions? And we, we certainly have the tools today. Zoom is just one of them. But how can we foster that? So what you have to ask yourself, and, and this would be your first piece of homework, I'd say, uh, to walk away with today, is where are you currently in what your employees are expecting from you and what you're really delivering on with them? When's the last time you did an employee opinion survey and really looked at the results in terms of are you delivering on your promise? Um, so often when I see those surveys done, it's more along the lines of, are you happy? Are you satisfied with your pay? Are you satisfied with your benefits? But are we digging into their true experience in working with us? Do they have the uh, opportunity to grow, whether that's just personally or professionally, whether that's climbing the company ladder or just getting better at my current job? What are we doing to help our people there? And so before you start on this journey, do an assessment, figure out where you are currently. That's where your building blocks are going to be. That's what we had to do with the medical practice whose case study I mentioned. We had to do an assessment to figure out where they were. And I had to get the stories from employees who would tell me that, you know, I just got a call from HR last week about a job offer. I said, oh, did you put in for a promotion or transfer? They said, no, they were calling me to be hired here. I've been working here for six months. I mean, that's a pretty crappy experience to have, right? Talk about feeling like you don't count or that you're just a number. HR calls you to offer you a job when you've been working there for six months. And that was not just kind of a one-off sort of scenario. Do you have things like that going on and how do we get them addressed? It's critical that we, we take a, an honest look, an unbiased look at where we are currently. Because ultimately, the candidate expectation has changed. Um, and so think about how you're presenting yourself digitally. So this, this telling of the employee experience, we've got to get that message out. So what does your company website look like? So often, I go to a company website, I click on careers, and you know, it takes me to, to some page with just job listings. Man, tell me a story. Tell me how cool it is to work there. Get some video testimonials from your happiest, most productive employees about why a candidate should come there. Go on a social media blitz. Have your people post things on Facebook or LinkedIn. Again, short videos of telling the story of life there. Wow, what a powerful recruiting tool. And we could spend another hour just talking about that. But think about the expectations that candidates have today. They, in order to make the commitment, want to know what the experience is going to be like working for you. So it all comes down to this, folks. This is the human capital value chain. If we do the things we've talked about today, well, we get these things. We know engaged employees stay longer. We know that we can turn engagement into experience, which drives business results. We know that if we drive employee satisfaction, that drives customer satisfaction. Customer satis satisfied customers are loyal. Loyal customers drive profitability. And ultimately, that's what we're in business to do. Even those of you who are in not-for-profit, you need to make money. Um, and so, it really is all about driving that chain. We start with our employees to get to those customers to get our business results. We fail in that employee link, it's going to impact the rest of the chain. So 
So I want you to think as we close up, where are you today? We start off talking about complacency, complacency island. Okay. Are you hanging out there saying, eh, you know, we're, we're kind of good where we are. We're not performing at our best, but eh. Or do you want to get on the boat and go over to the island of experience where candidates are aplenty, where high talent is hanging out, where owners and managers are seeing business results and profits increase. That's the real impact. That's what we're called to deliver on as HR professionals. I have a bonus for you today. If you stop by my website there at edcrow.com, there's a link that will get you a free 30 minute session with me. I'm gonna offer it to all of you who are in the room today. So if you'd like to talk about this further, you wanna share some concerns with me, get some advice, Go ahead and, and go to my homepage, click on that link. And in the memo, just type that you were in experience age at, at Tri-State Sherm. It'll get you that free 30 minutes with me. You want to learn more about driving business results? Also on my website or on Amazon, my book is available. It's still relatively hot off the press. I just published it in 2020, where I talk about the things we need to do to drive business results. That's what we're called to do in HR. That's my challenge for you. Thanks so much for attending today. I wish you the best of luck with the rest of the contest.